Kojima! The state of that thing. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And welcome back to yet another podcast. And thank you very much for tuning back in today. And today I've got um, a really cool guest on. I know for a fact that you will all know him. Um, but I will let him introduce himself. <laughs> Thank you very much, John. Um, hello, everybody. I'm Justin, and I run a small YouTube channel called the Casual called Casual MTB. Um, sort of trying to cover things from a normal guy's perspective, and uh, you know, try not to be one of these people who are living the dream every day and out on their bikes every day. Some of us can't do that, so some of us try and get their mountain biking in as and when they can. And that's the side of mountain biking that I try to cover. So uh, a little bit of humour thrown in, a few memes, a few dankness, all that sort of stuff. Um, but other than that, yeah, it's just been pretty cool. Around 1,200 odd subscribers now after a year, a year and a bit of going. So yeah, it's not it's not done too badly. But uh, yeah, that's who I am. <laughs> You're doing really well, mate. The channel's uh, really took off. Like it's it's. I've just like I mean because I've watched it from like early days and watched it grow and grow and grow and seeing like you hit like three hundred and things like this and I think it's so strange like seeing how you went in and I'm seeing kind of my kind of channel like hitting two hundred mark etc cetera, etc cetera, and stuff like that I think it's it's really cool to see how things have gone over the years and stuff like that um, how how do you feel it's it's went from like the beginning like do you feel like you've you've seen it like grow like quite rapidly or do you think it's been like a kind of a slow sort of thing or i uh, it's been a bit of a slow sort of thing because i've not really had any sort of i suppose uh, viral hits and uh, all that sort of thing <laughs> i've not uh, had uh, <laughs> i've not had the had the uh, fabio vidma style uh, red bull edit to, re to really launch things off of and all that kind of thing so it's, it's been a bit, bit of a slow grind more than anything um <laughs> The main thing that's uh, helped me grow is making videos really for um, and aiming them at YouTube search results. So when people search for, say, because the one that's actually really doing really well now and has suddenly had a bit of an uplift just today, actually, is the one about the cycle to work schemes oh, okay. uh, that I did well over a year ago now. And uh, people are still commenting on that. I had two comments on that today alone, <laughs> which was uh, which is interesting for a year and a bit old video. So yeah, uh, targeting the search results seems to be it seems to be the thing to do. Is um, if you want the slow long term burn. But then you've done that as well, haven't you, with your um, with your boss nut uh, bike check? I'm not gonna lie. I haven't got a clue what I'm doing. <laughs> <laughs> I just get it's ideas. For you, whatever it was. Thing is, though, I get so many comments going. Like I had one like the other week, and it said like, "Why aren't you at one k yet?" I'm just like, because I don't put time and effort into actually researching. Um, you know exactly what what's what's going to be like the viable option for me. Really, I don't I don't do this kind of like research and stuff like this. I was like, I I, I want to make videos what I want to make, and if it turns out to be good, then that's fine. Because like a lot of what goes through my head, it's very sporadic, and you'll see you'll see that throughout the videos. Like I'll go through like phases of going through different things and stuff like that especially with the the editing style and stuff but like yeah. i've seen i've seen your like your channel kind of like just get like better and better and better like I, I mean obviously that's through like like maturity of the channel and like more kind of experience and stuff like that i do you, how how do you feel about like how it's progressed and stuff like from when you first started and things like that like how how do you feel like your styles moved or like what the channels kind of did differently Oh God, it's, it's night and day compared to what it was. So even now I can tell the difference between my confidence on camera and how I pronounce words and how I say sentences and simple things like that compared to what it was in the beginning. So I'm doing things like less jump cuts because I'm concentrating on not saying um so much and things like that. Yeah. And I'm making editing it easier for myself when I go to get onto my computer by not by concentrating on how I'm pronouncing things. And oh, there's a spider on my microphone. That's cool. Um, your yeet chucker. So this is me recording in my shed, and the, <laughs> and of course it's spider season because it's autumn, and the, and this shed is chock full of the damn things. Yeah. 
So uh, there's that. But yeah, it's night and day. And obviously, with more experience of doing YouTube, the better you get at it. And the more you find um, sort of workarounds to problems that you may have that you've never really thought of before. So, for example, when I've done a few product reviews now already, you know how people have these, uh, like the shots of the product spinning, or they have the shot, a slow uh, pan across of the product and things like yeah. that. Well, a lot of people think that you need, for example, like slides to mount your camera on and things like that. But instead, what I do is I stick the... Because I film everything on my phone as well. I don't film anything on a normal camera. Everything's done on my phone or on an action cam. Yeah. And with the phone, I stick it in slow motion and then just pan really quickly. Because the quicker you can pan, the smoother you are. But of course, because I'm in slow motion, it looks like it's normal speed. So then it looks like my smooth slow motion shot and stuff like that. that. So you kind of work. Top hack as well, though. Can I just say that's really <laughs> credit where credit's due. That's that's using like the camera technology to its best there, really. Um, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I'm actually I'm actually doing an upgrade to the next iPhone, so I'm uh, hopefully going to take advantage of the th three lenses that they got on that thing now and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> but it, but it just goes to show that you that you, you know if you if you're thinking of starting a YouTube channel, you don't need to buy loads of kits to do it, and you don't need to um, and you don't need to have all the gear in terms of microphones and things like that. Phones these days are good enough to do 99% of what most cameras can do, save for uh, having a DSLR and, and decent lenses and things like that to really get shots lovely. But if you're just film, uh, blogging or blogging or you're filming stuff for YouTube, a phone is fine these days and a phone is really, really good these days. And again, if you don't start, then you'll never get started. So just give it a go and get better. Just do it. Literally just pull the, pull the trigger and just go for it. Um, I think we've got a little bit of interference of your mic there, mate. It's kind of crackling a bit there. I don't know. Have if I? Better. That might actually be what it is. Is I've got a, uh, I've got a uh, timer for all my power brick and stuff. So hold on. Let me turn that off. Oh my god, that was a huge spider that just ran away. Then. <laughs> I think like the thing was off with, with you and me as well, Justin. Like we tend to keep things incredibly casual. I mean, not to throw any puns into the mist of things there. Huh. Um, you know, I, I think we've, our channels kind of like tend to be very similar in that aspect. Is it, it's, it's for the, for the, for the peasants of the, the mountain bike world, you know, us <laughs> who can't afford, you know, like 10 grand bikes, et cetera, et cetera. And I think that that really benefits the community a lot as well. Um, it, it is, it's, it's great to see like the, um, it's great to see all these kind of like big, huge beasts of bikes and like 10 grand bikes this that the other but when it comes down to things like when when i want to learn something about a bike or whatever like that like i'm i'm the guy who's like going on youtube looking for things like your channel and stuff like that and yeah i'm like uh, right okay how do i do this like and you know you've got like for example like park tools they have like if you haven't already checked out park tools like youtube page it's like the most comprehensive it's what they did was they set up a youtube channel to kind of go through every piece of mechanical information um how to do everything this that the other and it was just an absolute masterpiece of like youtube and, and calvin the guy who runs it he's incredibly funny like for somebody who's came he's in like your granddad <laughs> yeah. he's like watching your granddad and getting all your tips off of him isn't he he's, it, he's it great is. i love calvin but the yeah, the Park Tools YouTube channel is absolutely brilliant. There it's isn't smashing. a single thing on a bike they haven't done or covered, and even, and even then, there's more that you've never thought of before that they will then cover, and and they do it in short videos as well, in short two or three minute videos. They don't go for length, and they don't try to, you know, do all this algorithm stuff and say, you know, you must have X number of watch time. They just get the information, put it in front of you. And there you go. That's it. And it, and they also show you how to use pretty much every single one of their tools, which is the great, which is great as well. Because of course, it doesn't just apply to their branded tools; it applies to everyone's. But it just means so that yeah. there's a library there for almost anything you want to do with a bike. I mean, they covered even things like um, hubs on commuter bikes and stuff like that. You know, the ones with uh, where they got the like little electric motors inside the yeah, hubs. I saw that. Like that. Yeah, that was quite interesting, actually. Yeah, just so the it's little like, things like that, which kind of like you, you don't think of. You're like, oh, hang on a minute, like that. That's that's my kind of category. They've done it, which is really cool. But like, yeah, exactly. I mean, YouTube is actually the world the world's second biggest search engine. 
Yeah. So if so, if you want to find out how to do something or what or or uh, or how the way something should be or whatever it is, YouTube's the place to go. No, YouTube is it's 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 the best in the world. So and it's the the best and the worst place to be really, because you're always <laughs> gonna. <laughs> I mean, I've seen some videos like trying to learn things, and it's just been like the worst advice ever, and I've just been like, oh, like. It depends on it depends on how re well researched it is, isn't it? I mean, for example, yeah. with my um, cycle to work scheme video, I actually spent a week researching that and then writing out a script and then going and film filming it. So it actually took quite a lot of effort on that one. But yeah. because I put in the effort, it's paying off now. 100%. Whereas if I hadn't, and I just said a load of crap about how how my experience was when I bought it, but then not being able to answer any other questions other than my own experience, nobody would have given a sod 100%. because it would have been irrelevant to other people. And that, and that's really the main thing. I mean, the great thing that about YouTube is that you can be as specific as you want, though. So, for example, I actually used YouTube to help me fix my toilet when my flush valve on the toilet was broken. Yeah. And I searched for the specific, like, part number of this, of my flush. Uh, vow that I had and the video came up showing me how to replace that exact thing and I was like oh well, great and now I know the wonders of the internet exactly um, if there's uh, if it exists there's a video of it somewhere this is it this is it I mean I, there's there's other things out there that, you know I mean I, I used to like read a lot of magazines and in, in the time and like they occasionally did have like like the help sections in there and then you could write in and things like this you know like answers on a postcard for for those of a certain age and era uh you know <laughs> and it's, it's so much has changed now like and it, it it just makes you feel like we've got like the biggest amount of information to help fix bikes like that we'll ever ever have like the internet is just such a, a vast sort of thing really and it's so good i mean without it i mean i wouldn't have the channel you wouldn't have your channel kind of thing you know so it, it's somewhere that we're kind of like i feel good that we're adding to it and being able to to help people because i mean god knows the amount of people who've messaged me and again if calibers listen to this which hopefully they are they have messaged me and what's the bite like uh, uh, I don't know what the bike's like. Is it good? Is it is it like just kind of do this, kind of do that? It, the bike can do anything. Like trust me, I've taken it to Scotland and Wales, and I've had one. Well, uh, the only things I've changed is the pedals and the handle grip, bar, the handlebar grips, and I've put a dropper post in. Everything else has been stock from day one, and I've had that over a year now. Tires are worn slightly, and I've changed the inner tube once, and I've changed the chain. Yeah, I mean that's, that's a it. that's a great thing about the boss about the boss nuts because because uh, for those of you listening who don't know already, although you probably should, um, we both ride caliber boss nuts. I ride the V1, and you ride an Evo, don't you? Um, I think. Yeah. Yeah. So you have an Evo, and the new bikes just come out as well, and we're both members of the caliber boss nut riders group on Facebook, which is now eighteen hundred members, I think. Something it is. like that. Yeah, I think it's. Yeah, kind of, I think it's, it's just ticked over eighteen hundred members. And it's there's creepy. new people joining every day who are buying this bike, and people are, who are joining as well just to ask for advice and say and see whether they should get it. I mean, I suppose asking the Caliber Boss Nut Riders group if they should buy a Caliber Boss Nut is probably going to get you get you an answer you should be expecting, which yeah. is yes, of course you should because we all ride these Boss Nuts. But there are still people that go on and ask things like, for example, uh, there was one was it yesterday or today where the guy asked, uh, "Has anybody had any? Uh, is the Boss Nut crap?" yeah like, i saw that and it was like well no because we all ride them and he's like well but is it should i buy one and it's like no it's not crap just just buy one and so there are still people out there who ask those sort of questions who are still unsure even if like the buying decision has already been pretty much made by them it's a it's an interesting thing <laughs> it's so strange that question but like yeah Still though, I, I get questions all the time, and like I had a, a guy message me like not so long ago, and he was like, after messaging me, he was like, "Oh, dude, I, thank you so much. I went and bought a, a boss nut. Um, I don't know how many. I, I, every time someone buys a boss nut or speaks to me about buying a boss nut, things like this, or if I've got some kind of contact with them, I direct them towards the group. And I'm yeah, like, go to Calibre Boss Nut Riders group if you need to know, like if you want to ask questions, like say, what kind of brake pads do I need, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, you can go in the search bar, you can find it in there. It's all in there. We've got an entire, like it, pretty much an encyclopedia of the most common issues, which are occurring, 
uh, with the bikes. And it's like, you can find out exactly what's going on with it, why it happened and what you can replace it with if you need to, or you can speak to people about like things like what they've did with warranties and et cetera and things like that. Like, or did they take it to a bike mechanics? There's so much going on in that group. And I've had so many people like coming to me and going like, like, what, what kind of, what should I do this, that, the other, and things like this. I'm like, go to the group, find out in the group. Like, I don't know who they are, like, half the time, because I think, cause, like, they come to me on YouTube or Instagram, so I don't know, like, their, their full name. So when they join up on Facebook, I'm like, I don't know who they are. But, like, it, it, I have seen an influx in people going in there. So I'm, I'm kind of hoping that some of it came through asking and things like this. Um, but that's that's been good, though. The community's growing, and it's, you know, it, it has its ups and downs, as most communities do, things like this. But uh, for the most part, I think it's been an absolute cracking group. And I've yeah, I mean, for, I mean, it's it's the main thing about it that's different to almost all other mountain biking groups you find on Facebook is that it's constructive, and the people on there are genuinely helpful. Mm. And also, we've actually got... I say we, it's, it's, it's uh, Scott and Dan, who are the admins, really, um, <laughs> yeah. have also got the involvement of of the staff from Calibre. So yeah. Calibre Mike has been involved there. They've got the graphic designer who's on there who's helped them design things like their logo and stuff like that. They've got people who have been involved in the testing and the geometry of the bikes who are, and who, people who are involved in warranties and stuff like that. So if you need a question answered there's no other place to go other than that group. And it's really, really open. And, that, and I found that with Calibre in general, to be honest with you. I've had you know, I've had, had issues where I've rounded off bolts and stuff like that because I'm a ham-fisted oaf when trying to do maintenance myself. Yep, and I've messaged, I've messaged uh, Calibre on their Facebook uh, group and they've gotten back to me within, within a day or so and got me bolts, nuts and everything sent out free of charge. You know they're really really helpful and they're, and they're mountain bikers as well so they all un- so they understand the same pains that we all go through when we're trying to do stuff to our own bikes and in- inevitably it goes wrong yeah. or we have an issue that shouldn't have happened uh, even on a on a bike like mine which is now what three years out of two three years out of warranty i think two years now i think actually because it's 2017 yeah two years heading for three yeah it's getting on now isn't it yeah, I mean, it's a funny thing. It's like my, my bike is now, because my bike is so old, like, well, it's not so old. It's still it's still a nice. really good and really nice and well-maintained bike. But because it's old in the sense of fashion and stuff, my knowledge on Caliber Boss Nuts is actually getting out of date. Yeah. So now, that, so, so now there's this funny thing where I'm like feeling pressure to get a new bike, but not for the reasons that mo- most people get a new bike. It's like, oh, I want something shiny and all this kind of stuff. It's like, it's like oh, I need a new bike because if I get the new bike, I can do videos about the new bike and then I can grow the channel based around the new bike because the new bike is <laughs> and all this kind of stuff. So it's, so it's funny. I'm, I'm looking at doing bloody uh, cycle to work scheme again because I want a, the new, new boss nuts. But uh, yeah, it's uh, funny how it well. works out like that in the end. <laughs> that, that cap's been increased as well for um, spending. So that's... Yeah, although as far as I've seen, most schemes still limit to 1,000 even, uh, even if the um, cap has been removed. So I think there's still only one uh, scheme that does does it with an unlimited cap, which mm. is the Green Commuter Initiative, and they and they're really centered around doing it for e-bikes. So you yeah. can get an e-mountain bike on that, um, and I think they they've increased the time limit to pay it off as well to 24 months rather than 12, which means that you're not going to be paying off like 200 or 300 quid a month off your five grand e-bike just to try and get it in within a year it's going to spread out a little bit more which is a bit nicer so yeah, yeah. It, it's all it's kind of like it's going in a positive direction i guess but i think there's a few things that people need to know about the cycle the work scheme as well because from what my I, I have honestly i'll be honest like i didn't really research it that much because i i assumed it was a basically it was like a, a pay monthly sort of scheme it comes like they take it out your paycheck and then that's it like you, you pay for it and then once it's done it's done but it's not yeah. it's the bike's not yours is that correct so the bike isn't yours again it all depends on the scheme but for most schemes the bike isn't yours for around three or four years but then at the end of the end of that three or four years one of two things will either happen and again it depends on the scheme Either one, there'll be a small nominal payment of around, I think it's 10% of the cost of the bike. So if, or no, it's not 10%, sorry. It's around two or 3%, I think actually. So thinking of that, because um, this happened with my boss nuts and it was, um, 
I think a payment of around thirty pounds. I think it was to keep okay. the bike. And even then, it was like, okay, fine, jump change, 30 quid, off you go. Um, others, it's like, with others, it's a simple, uh, do you want to keep the bike? Yes. Tick, sign, you've got the bike, all yours. But then saying that, I've never had a problem with actually with selling a bike before that that four, four or five years has been up. I think they, I think 90% of people who do it end up selling the bike well before that time period anyway. So it's, yeah. it's never really caused a problem. The bike isn't technically yours but they i don't think i've ever come across an instance where they've ever checked that you've still got that bike <laughs> <laughs> or are looking after it well or haven't modified it and all this kind of stuff yeah. but i don't think they've ever checked i think it's something they have to put on on there because it's a government scheme yeah exactly. um just to say that it's limited and there's and there's certain stipulations you have to meet and all this kind of st stuff and because it's government money, they have to check that it's being spent correctly and all this kind of stuff. And are these people actually commuting? And so it's, it's just it's just a bit of extra extra paperwork you have to do just to uh, say, yes, of course I'm not using this bike to go off six-foot drop-offs at Bike Park Wales and stuff like that, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Who would do that? Who would do that? Definitely not me. Mind you saying that, I was... Uh, when, um, well... I can't. I think it's. I'm getting so confused of all my kind of like my timings now. But I, been like when I was at Bike Park Wales, um, there was a guy who was uh, on a V1, um, and I was. I looked at it and I was like, do you know what? That is, it's a really good looking bike, like the 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 paint, like the paint, like colours and stuff like that. It was really nice looking colours actually. I, I, the one of the reasons why I picked the Evo was because of the colour. I, re, I quite like the colour. Um, but I'm like looking at back at yours now, like and I'm just looking at it and go, I, do you know what? I really like the paint scheme on it. <laughs> it looks really nice. Um, and he, the guy just came out of nowhere, came up from behind us, and he was just like, "Yeah, Culver bikes, great, mate." I was like, "Yeah, spot on, mate." <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's the first time I've seen a, a Culver in the wild, other than mine. Hashtag I, not a cult. <laughs> <laughs> what a no, there's, there's loads of them out there. I mean, I've seen them out at my local trail. Uh, I, I think I've seen two or three different people with them, as, as well as mine. Yeah. And then, of course, there's the uh, Canic Chase meetup they do. They do. They're doing up there next week, uh, where there are close to sixty boss nuts that are going to be there. Because <laughs> I'm not doing. I'm not doing the meet this year, but I did the meet last year there. And there were, I think it was 54 of us in total, something like that. So I think, I think the number was over 50, and it was ridiculous, the amount of boss nuts that were there. And the main thing was uh, that I noticed was how many of them were standard, which was uh, well, pretty much zero. <laughs> All of them had had something done to them, whether that was something as simple as grips or and grips and uh, pedals, or whether it was new tires, new suspension. Uh, people had done things, things like... I don't know what that was. People have done things like uh, put their own uh, headset cups in and things like that, new handlebars. Yeah. Everyone had a dropper post, of course, and of course at that time it, the bike didn't come with a dropper. Uh, I don't think it, the, the new one that comes with a dropper now either, does it? I don't think it does, mate, no. No, I think it's the Triple B that, uh, Triple that comes B with one. Yeah, um, I think the Sentry does, does it? Yeah, Sentry definitely does, but then I think it would be uh, pretty crappy if uh, the Sentry didn't come with one of the price <laughs> yeah. it is. Yeah, no, there's like there's definitely like a. I feel like we're part of some kind of like, it's a, not it. But you see, it's funny because we say it's a cult because it, it I kind of, it, in a comical sense, like in a kind of like a very Monty Python esque sort of way, we are kind of like a cult really. But I, it's like. You know when you're like a kid and you get the the craze there where you're like um I, I don't know like you, you can customize something you can like have like different colored beads on a like a I don't know like one of those scoobies that the kids used to have and things like this or different colored yo-yos and stuff like I oh think yeah yeah, yeah. kind of like kids in that way like we've got this kind of like way where we're like I've got a stock bike which is really good and I've picked it because it's incredibly good but I'm going to modify it anyway I'm going to make it a bit more mine <laughs> and you know like for me I, I I change things out of necessity, and purely for the the basis of the channel. Really, what I did was I was just like going to keep everything as long as possible and see how long it lasts, how what how it manages and things like this. And to be honest with you, like it's been absolutely smashing. Like we went to the Quantox, and like I've done like a few laps down there, and that that place is uh, it's pretty slippy in the wet, and. I have on good authority that it wasn't as slippy as it could have been. 
<laughs> but the worn down tires, um, uh, stock is what you get on the Evo, like they haven't been changed whatsoever. Um, and it gets ridden quite a lot. Uh, they managed that they, you know, they had a few slips every now and then and stuff like that. And I think it's just, it's done a good judgment from Calibre from putting good components on it, which is another thing I think people need to be aware of as well. Like people go like, oh yeah, it's Calibre bikes. Like no, it, they're they're not good. The the wheels do this that, and the other. Like you, that's not Calibre. Calibre aren't making those. That's the the components. Like the manufacturers. So that's Shimano. That's SRAM. That's what, whoever it is and things like that. WCB in this case. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and the, people need to be kind of like be aware of like you you buy for what you get and need to be aware of the the, the limitations of what a bike can achieve under a strict budget etc things like this and i think people need, have had a bit of a, a shock with how well this bike adjusts to pretty much everything really climbing downhill etc um, and these bikes have like absolutely stormed it through like quite a quite a lot of like tests and things and they've just just won another award as well haven't they like the best under 2k i think it was what what more do you want from a bike? And it is yet you still see some people going like, oh well, it's cheap components, just that you ever like. <laughs> come on, man, come on. Well, the funny well the funny thing is is that the, because the caliber boss nut is out there, it's spawned a load of a load of competitors now. So you've got people like, uh, for example, Vitus on Chain Reaction. They're they're coming out with um, similarly priced bikes, but even they can't get around down to the same price of 1100 quid they've got they've only managed to get down to 1249 i think yeah um and then there's that what's that halfords brand that's um oh no don't do this to us i, I, I had it <laughs> i had it um oh you know the one i mean though there, there's mean. a halfords there's a brand from halfords and they've also got a thousand pound uh trail bike there's actually come very very close to the boss of boss nut in terms of um test results and things like that but it's hasn't toppled the king just yet but for what one thing it does do is it, it offers people another option if for example you're buying this on the cycle to work scheme hmm. they only allow you to buy a bike through halfords which some schemes do yeah so it so what the boss nut has done is actually created a whole new market segment of bike where before there was none i mean the be, i mean if you wanted a bike for a thousand pounds previously if it was a full suspension, it was going to be a crap, a really crap one. And if it was a hardtail, it was going to be a really good one. There was no sort of in between. Yeah. So this good value full suspension that allows you to then springboard and upgrade and go on to the next bike after a, after a few years is something that the boss nut pretty much created all on its own. And credit to Mike Sanderson from Calibre for doing that. Yeah, absolutely, hundred percent. Like I've seen like. You know, like prior to this, and like having read through, you know, like parts of like the nineties and the noughties and things like this, like I've never ever seen like a, a bike brand that's been so well managed and well put together and well sort of like sanctioned towards people who aren't on, you know, you know, five five grand a, a month or whatever like that. You know, they're not on these sort of big wages, and they've got families, they've got things, but they want to get out and ride these bikes but they need something that's capable and able to last because it's, it's pointless you going to Halfords and buying like a really really cheap bike like an Apollo or something like that and then you know finding out night next week that it breaks and you haven't got that it's, it's like that that video with um Mahalo my dude where he buys the bike and he learns the bike and he, the handlebars twist around and stuff then he gets interested he looks at researches it and gets a better bike more you know more parts of the bikes things like this and oh the how to be a mountain biker one yeah and i yeah. think that, that that in itself like most of that's been skipped because of the like having a bike like the boss nut um you know you don't need to upgrade it you can still ride everything that you can ride and stuff like that but like if you want to upgrade it like it makes them it does make a difference it makes a yeah a massive oh, yeah, difference. absolutely it does and uh, i think people are starting to even like normal people who aren't strictly speaking enthusiasts in terms of mountain biking and cycling and all this kind of stuff people are starting to come to get to grips with the fact that actually getting a decent bike uh, with decent components up front is way way better than starting off on a cheap bike mm. because the cheap bike is going to be heavy and it's just going to put you off the whole thing yeah because i mean you, you can still because kids bikes uh, these days 
for example, are a million times better than they were even oh, even five yeah. or six years ago. They are a million times better. Um, I've got uh, my little ones, a little uh, frog. Uh, so my my daughter has a frog balance bike yeah. uh, through a scheme called the Cycle Club, where you pay for it monthly, and then when, when, as she grows up to bigger bikes, you hand the bike back and get another one. So and my cool. son has a uh, a little Vitus, yeah. a Vitus 16. And in terms of those bikes compared to what I was riding when I was young, go God, it's just insane. I can't believe that we managed to ride the, the bikes that we did back then because... And what we did on them. Just weighed a ton. <laughs> they weighed an absolute ton. They weighed more than they weighed more than the boss nut does. Yeah. And this is for like a 10-year-old or a, or a 12-year-old, you know? Mental. How are people supposed to get into biking like that? And it's, and it's cool to see companies like Caliber, for example, making making uh, one-off like little frames of the boss nut for for riders like Kenzie Nevard. So if they see, because Kenzie's a, an awesome rider. I don't know how old he is, actually. How old is Kenzie? I think he's about 12 or something. I think something like that. But he's yeah. been around since he was about eight or nine, I think. And he's a he's a little he's a he's a little dude, but he is an absolute shredder. And he yeah. and he got the back of caliber, and they made him a little small frame. That's cool. Man. Uh, for the boss of the boss nuts, a little tiny, tiny like extra small one. And it's cool to see companies doing that and really starting to bring kids through um, the ranks of mountain biking through better bikes. And so more kids are getting getting uh, involved in it. And it's actually making me really, really excited for what we're going to see in 10 years' time in terms of the quality of the riders that are going to be out there that are like 18 or 19 years old. Yeah. It's going to be insane. It's like all, all, it's like in Formula One, the riders there, the riders, drivers there are going to get younger and younger in terms of their in terms of where they're at in their peak skill. Um, and I don't know where I was going with that, but either way, great kids' kids bikes are really, really good now, and I'm really, really excited to see what uh, what comes next in terms of the the uh, awesome kids that are coming out coming out and about and, and their skills. No, definitely, and I mean, like you, you, you're talking about like what the kids are going to be able to do, um, you know, like the Red Bull, like heart, the the rampage and things like that. It's going to look like an absolute picnic, you know, in about <laughs> ten years' time. It's going to be absolutely mental. I mean, exactly. You, I mean, you see the kids like tw- you know, ten, eleven, twelve year olds now at the at the jump park and the, the pump tracks and things like that, and they're mental, absolutely yeah, mental. Absolutely mental. <laughs> I mean, I see some of the kids like in my like local indoor skate park, uh, you know, and they're about like ten to ten to twelve, you know, and they're absolutely smashing it around the the park and they're doing backflips and all sorts of stuff like this, and they they're not like they're not going to go anywhere like with that kind of thing like they just ride because they like to ride and stuff like that but when you see the ones who are like brought up in a family full of bikes and they get pushed into like racing this that the other and they start doing these sort of things i mean uh, if you look at like, like any of the red bull competitions like the younger like the the younger riders the junior riders they are absolutely nailing it and they're doing stuff that like it took the the older generation a lot longer to do yeah, granted due to the technology, um, but I haven't like doing it from a young age. Like I, I've skied since I was a kid, so that's like second nature for me now. Like it doesn't matter what happens, I'll always kind of land back on my feet again. Yeah, and it's the same for these kids on bikes and stuff like that. They're they're just like it, the, it's like they're webbed feet, like they become part of the bike, and it becomes so natural for them to ride and do things and get out of difficult situations that. It's gonna be so. I I I would absolutely hate to be a judge, like for any slope style or anything like that, because these kids are able to kind of like manipulate the bikes in such a way that it just doesn't seem normal. Like if you're yeah. watching like the the like the X Games, like doing like a quad flip or whatever like this, or like a, a quad tail whip, etc. It's becoming absolutely mental. Uh, and it was the same with snowboarding as well, like doing the triple call, the first triple call that was done. And it was absolutely just amazing to see, like it was part of history. Like it's great to see that you're part of history and watching it and stuff. But like, it was just mental. Like, and where does it stop? That's, well, that's the thing, it doesn't. The trick names are going to just get longer and longer as they start comboing all these things together and it's, good, and it's not going to stop. These things are... Uh, pretty ridiculous <laughs> yeah no 100 percent. and you're gonna see like the ramps just getting bigger and bigger and bigger and it's just like 
Oh my god, I can I'll stick to blues and reds, please. <laughs> yeah, well, it's like Audi nines and stuff like that, and the dark fests and stuff like that, isn't it? You know, you you didn't see stuff like that around. You know, like, like stuff like that would have been seen more at uh, Red Bull Rampage when that first started. Whereas yeah. now it's like, oh, it's just another slope star competition. No, definitely. Greg Minard was up in Newcastle the other day. Oh yeah, oh yeah. yeah he was doing his uh, talking show that he's got going on, hasn't he? Yeah, he's. I didn't. I didn't get a chance to see it, but a um, friend of mine was down there chatting to him. Really nice guy. <coughs> it's uh, nice to chat to like you know these pro riders and stuff like that and get a chance. I mean, I mean, granted, if it's off season and stuff like Danny Hart's literally down the road, and occasionally you do see him riding around and stuff. My yeah. God, it's so good to watch them. <laughs> <laughs> it's it's totally different. If, I mean, the only way I can compare it really is like, if you're like, if if you've watched boxing on TV for so long and you watched it and you're like, yeah, I know boxing. And then if you watch it live in person, the shock of seeing the physicalness right in front of you, it's complete like night and day. Like watching, yeah. like watching it on TV, like to... To go and live and watching it, it's just it's unbelievable. Like, even some of the guys at like my my first race, like that was just incredible watching them. Like, they, my mechanic, Skinny Mick, call him my mechanic. He's not my mechanic, but like, the mechanic <laughs> I take the bike He's to. Mechanic, you, you have to <laughs> it's my own personal mechanic. <laughs> <laughs> and I, you know, watching him because he's a he's like. I don't, I don't know what sort of level he's at, like within like rankings or whatever, like this. But like he's insane. He's sponsored and stuff like this. And seeing the stuff that he was pulling off on that day was just absolutely amazing. Like it's just, it's so good to watch, though. Yeah, well, it's like when I go out riding with Joe, who's uh, the guy that's been on. He's been on my YouTube channel a few times now because he's just so fun to watch. <laughs> yeah, because he's the because he's the one with all the trial skills and things like that. And he he basically is my mechanic as well. As long as I pay him in beer and biscuits. He's, he's he's happy to be my mechanic for as long as I can keep feeding them to him, That's but it. uh, yeah, it's, it's his skills and because he started off riding from really really young and he knows a lot of the a lot of the younger riders in my area as well. Yeah, and again, like you say, it just comes natural to him the the where his body needs to be on the bike, the way that he moves the bike around. And yeah, he's not like at the level of you know some of these slope style people at the worlds and stuff like that, but the stuff that you can do on the bike is just so far out of reach of what I can do at the mo moment that it's just insane. But then this is part of why I'm trying to, I've, I'm back in the gym now and I'm trying to get fitter because I thought, well, the first step to actually being a good mountain biker is actually being able to move it around without, without losing my breath every time. Yeah. <laughs> no, I realized that when I was doing stuff like around the, like the Quantox and stuff like this, I thought, I, yeah. I, I'm reasonably fit. Like I ride up hills nearly every day. Um, you know, and it, it, it puts things in pressure. But the thing that you kind of really kind of threw me is like when you're riding uplift for the most part of the day, I, how how do you get out of breath? It's downhill. Yeah. <laughs> it's not normal. Uh, I was I, I got down the bottom of one of the trails at Bike Park Wheels and I was like, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. It's like there's no, there's absolutely no real long downhill runs where around where I am. There's maybe and, and and the downhill runs that there are are generally pretty straight and they're just uh, and they're just double track uh, farm roads and things like this that are gravel. So there's not really any proper downhill. The first time I went to Forest of Dean and did the Verderers Trail, which is their long blue trail. Mm. It has a a descent at the end which is around uh, probably a couple of minutes. It's not that long, uh, but it feels a lot longer than it than it is. And going down that, I was just finding because of the, all the undulations and having to pump into berms and things like this, I was finding myself almost collapsing down on the bike every time I went into these things because uh, my legs just weren't strong enough, yeah. or, or at least those specific muscles. I mean, I have a lot of go in me. I can I can pedal uphill for days, and I'm I'm good at climbing, but and I'm good at long distance as well, but. In terms of the the actual strength needed to be able to pump the bike and support myself when going down those hills, it was insane how quickly I I suddenly felt like oh god I'm in a, a bit out of my depth here. It was ridiculous. <laughs> yeah. Like I, my arm pump was okay, but again I was just holding on for dear life. It wasn't really actively shredding as a, as as you would say because 
again, it, everything caught me out by caught me by surprise. So I did it. I went up and did it again, and I felt better the, for the first part. But I just ended up getting tired, uh, tired quicker, which meant that again I was sort of a passenger all the way down to the bottom again. Tell you what, the the, the majority of people who I saw at bike park wheels was the older, the old farts, like you know, like going into the forties and fifties and stuff like that. Yeah, it's so good to see that though. It's so good because I'm like, there's there's hope, there's hope, and not yeah. one of them had an. Well, e-bike the thing to do well. now is to buy an e-bike, and uh, and then you can keep up with the kids. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, none of them had e-bikes. I mean, granted, it's all uplift and downhill and stuff like that. But at the same time, though, they were like, oh yeah, we're gonna hit this trail, we're gonna hit that trail, that stuff that you know, we're gonna go here, there, and everywhere. And I was like, fair play to you, fair, fair play, because like, you know, like, I think. You get to a certain age and things just become a little bit harder. I mean, I'm I'm coming up 31 now, like, and I know that's not really a thing I should be saying because you're supposed to be hitting your, your your physical pride at like 30 or something like that. But I'm I'm still good to go for you know like long distance this that the other and stuff like that. Uh, I I don't feel like I have a struggle struggle to the point where I'm like no I've got to hand the towel in. But yeah. There's times where you kind of like. Oh, well, I wish I could be in the gym a little bit more. Like I say, <laughs> it just kind of push myself a little bit more. It does help, though. Yeah, I mean, the only reason I've been able to go to the gym now is because uh, we've dis- I've discovered one that's right near my work, like literally a, a two-minute walk away, and I can go on my lunch times. Ah. Whereas if that wasn't the case, I probably wouldn't really have an opportunity because obviously I get home, and I get home, I leave the house at half seven in the morning, I get home at between six and seven depending on how traffic is that day yeah. and then i've got to put the kids to bed and then after that i've got to have dinner and then i'm saying and then i actually have to spend some time with the wife and of course by that time it's like oh you can't really go oh bye darling i'm off out for two hours to go and work <laughs> on my muscles i'm gonna to go your swap. benefit my dear <laughs> so you want to get back you, get and to you look can't at do them. that three or four times a week <laughs> otherwise you'd never see your kids or your wife again and they no, probably end up divorcing you <laughs> This is it. This is it. You know, and I can imagine that probably a lot of arguments have started because of things like go to the gym or bikes and things like that. But you know, it, it, these things, you know, you've got to try and get them in as much as you can, really. I guess. But I suppose with having kids and you know, all that kind of stuff, it's it's difficult. But if, yeah. it's, if it's on hand, it's close. That's good. Fair play to you, mate. It's, uh, <laughs> well, that's just- well, that's the reason I started the channel was to try and keep myself linked to mountain biking when I knew I was going to do it less and less because I had uh, because I had the kids. So even if I'm not actually riding the bike, I'm, I'm still there tinkering with it or learning about new biking stuff. And and uh, in the case of where I'm at now with it is uh, getting free products sent to me to review, which is uh, really cool. But then it's finding the time to actually do it <laughs> yeah. is the other is the other thing is, is thing I've got to get out there and I know that for for example the next product that, that I'm reviewing I've got to do a ride before I fit it and then I got to, and then I've got to come back to film me fitting it and then to go do a ride after fitting it and then come back and do final thoughts and all this kind of stuff so that's probably a good at least two or three days of work yeah like, and more, it is work and more. and more yeah and more and more with editing yeah absolutely because of course the amount of um, the amount of footage you edit, generally speaking, it takes three three times ish longer to edit that footage than it was to film it. Yeah, a thousand percent. I mean, if anyone wants to come and uh, edit my videos from by Park Wheels and Quantox, uh, <laughs> fire away. Uh, drop me a message. How I'll many give hours you my of address. footage have you got? Uh, yes. <laughs> yes, you've got yes amount of footage. Um, I've got. You have some. I've got a 64 gig um, memory card in my DSLR that got filled up. Uh, oh wow! Useless stuff. Um, half the day just doesn't get used and stuff like that because it's just like you think you think at the time you think that might look good. I'll take it anyway. Always try and just just take everything. And if you don't need it, at least you've got it to say no. Uh, the GoPros. Um, I took some on. Like we had like five GoPros over the, the space of the week. Um, I think I used two of them or something like that. I had grand envisions and then just went, just thought, I, I just want to ride and I just want to like, just record as much as I can and yeah. without trying to interrupt it. Cause I uh, see that, that's where you and I differ, I think, because I, I've learned from the school of um, Paul the Punter where 
if it's even remotely boring or remotely nothing happening, cut it out, cut it out. immediately. No matter how interesting you think it is, think of the viewer and think of what they're going to think watching it and just get rid of it. And he has like cut everything. So he's, so I, I watched some of his live streams where he goes through YouTube, uh, other people's YouTube videos and he's just like, why is this in here? Cut it. Why is it? I'm bored. I'm off. Yeah. <laughs> and it's brutal. It's but he's but he's right honest. in a sense. And and I try to make life easier for myself by constantly being like press the pressing the button on my action camera and and and, and only when I think there's something interesting coming. But I have done times done it where I have filmed the whole thing. But I just found that by the time I get home and I start editing it, I am sat there for ages yeah so i so i so i'm i'm at the school of thinking now where where even if i think something interesting might happen i'll err on the side of caution and not film it because you know something else will happen and even so i can i can construct a story out of whatever whatever footage i get afterwards in the edit so even if i miss something that could be part of the story as well yeah <laughs> A hundred percent. Like I, I that, that's the it's a funny thing because like with, I think I I've, I've had like a bit of like a background in like, editing video and stuff like this and mm. I I kind of like learned little things along the way and stuff like this and and now I, I think like if I didn't have that footage I couldn't implement some of the ideas so like my sort of vision is now like just record as much as I can and enjoy as much as I can and then like just chop it up as much as you can and then just make it as visually and as exciting as possible uh, yeah so that it suits because like i, I there's been times i've been out in shoots before and like I, I went out there and like the memory cards being full or whatever and i couldn't delete anything because i had stuff on there that i needed etc or you know like it didn't have this or batteries out low and stuff like this and i wish i'd recorded things like that and i was like oh man really <laughs> wish i could have hit that and you know but these things happen i mean you you live and learn and you know that's part of life unfortunately <laughs> sometimes it's part of learning it's part of learning to youtube <laughs> sometimes things go tits up unfortunately kids exactly yeah. that they do i'm still waiting for the day where i where my memory card gives up after doing x number of hours footage i know it'll happen one day and i'm still going to be pissed off at myself when it does happen <laughs> for not having backups and things like this as well oh definitely i mean but the things you can do to prevent that uh, but I, I feel it's a bit of a rite of passage uh, yeah. as a as a YouTuber. I mean, I, I, I think it's silly. I call myself a YouTuber. Like people ask, I'm like, oh, I make YouTube videos. Like I don't say, oh, I'm a YouTuber. Like I don't think that's a, an appropriate title, really. Well, no, it's not because it's not what you spend ninety percent of your time doing, and it's not what defines <laughs> you, is it? You know, you know? I, mean, I, I, I spend ninety nine percent of my time with uh, you know doing my normal job, which is being a project manager. And, uh, you know, if somebody asks you what I do, as I say, I'm a project manager. And if they ask you if you have any hobbies, then then, then I mention the, the YouTube channel. But it's only at that point where it's like, oh, yeah, it's a hobby. You know, I'm not really making any money out of it or whatever. I get some stuff free every now and then. But it's uh, it's definitely not uh, it's definitely not all of me, as it were. You can't until I, th I think until you're full time YouTubing like someone like BKXZ is or someone or someone like that. It's uh, it's kind of hard to say that I'm a YouTuber, mm. especially with especially the way that YouTube is now, with really promoting only the larger channels and only wanting sanitized uh, sort of non-creative stuff as part of the channel because uh, as part of YouTube because uh, you know they're worried about advertisers leaving and all this kind of stuff and it's one of the reasons I actually demonetized every single one of my videos because I thought well. I'm not making enough. Can you hear that siren, by the way? I can, yeah. Yeah, I thought you might be able to. Are There's the something the going on, on outside. Yeah. Um, but back onto YouTube. So it's one of the reasons why I demonetized all of my videos because I thought, well, I'm not really making that much money out of it. I'm making, you know, eight dollars a month or something like whatever it is, and and I can't even get a payment of that until it tots up to $125. So therefore, I'm not going to get a payment for the best part of a year. So I might as well turn off the ads, prevent people from being discouraged from watching my videos because they have to get through an advert, first of all, yeah. and, and build the channel Smart. and then just and then just carry on with do it with working with um, uh, 
Did I swear to that bit? <laughs> you know, just, just carry on working with brands and things like that to test their products out, do a bit of advertisement for them and things like that. And I think that's really the way to go full time on YouTube these days. It's to work. It's working with brands rather than relying on the YouTube advertisement money because it really isn't enough. Obviously, you can do Patreon and so on as well. But then the question becomes. Oh, what added value can I offer my Patreon? What can I give to Patreon? Yeah, and, that's and what can I do for them? Because someone like BKXC, BKXC, he does his uh, ride videos, and people who watch him are interested in him. Yeah, like they're not watching it really for the riding; they're watching it because of him. And so, if so, he can offer them uncut footage of him and access to him as part of his. Uh, ask me anything uh, live streams that he does just for his uh, patreons and things like that then that's extra value they can add here they he yeah. can offer them uh there's another guy who is called oh what's his name i had his name in my head and it's literally just gone <laughs> oh dear. no no biker biker bar b1 biker Oh, he's, okay. he's got he's around about six thousand or seven thousand subscribers now, but he's got a Patreon that's really that he's got about I think a good hundred or so um, supporters, which is really good for that's someone with that good. little subscribers. But he can offer people, but he's worked with brands to and negotiated with brands to offer them discounts. So he's got exclusive discount codes that you and things like that that you get access to. Uh, when you become part of his Patreon. Yeah. But it's those sorts of things that they're offering that I'm not sure, like, okay, I'm thinking, okay, what could I offer? And the answer is, I don't know at the moment. <laughs> Obviously, once I start getting a bit bigger and I start getting more ideas and thoughts, the question that, it, it, you know, maybe I'll come up with an idea. But for now, it's like, well, if I can't offer anything, I kind of feel a bit scabby if asking people, asking people for money and effectively begging and going, please pay me to uh, support my hobby, effectively. The one I hear the most is, like, people go, like, um, yeah, if you want to support me, like, you know, so I can put food on the, ch on the table for my children, I'm like, no, don't bring your children into it. No, God don't do that. You've got sakes. a job. You're, you're doing this for fun and to try and build something else for yourself. This isn't, <laughs> you know, this isn't your only thing that you're doing. Your children well, I'm saying that someone like single track sampler. He literally buys food, food with his because he lives in a van. But uh, yeah, but uh, you know, someone like me or you who've got other jobs and they do YouTube on the side, uh, you're asking for you're asking for Patreon money effectively to support you doing your hobby and to build the channel. Because if you get money for the channel, you can do things like buy better equipment and you can buy things to test and you can get different bikes and all this kind of stuff and you can pay your petrol to get to somewhere you know to get to bike parks around the uk or in your case train or plane tickets and stuff like that yeah and that's really what i think it should be used for until you get big enough to go full time and then legitimately it really is putting food on the table i think so mate i think that, that you, you've got a valid point there though i um, i think priorities are supposed to be in check because like a lot of people just think oh i'm going to be a youtuber and that's it like don't don't get into YouTube if you think, A, you're going to make any money, make something of yourself, or not give yourself crippling depression because of the <laughs> amount of work. You know. <laughs> don't be fooled, I children. have crippling depression. Do, that, uh... do drugs instead. It's better for you. <laughs> yeah, it's also cheaper. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, it, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. Um I don't think it's going to be the last time we're going to hear your uh, beautiful dulcet tones on here. <laughs> well, um, thank you very much for saying so. It's been an absolute joy being on here. And you are uh, a very excellent and professional podcast host. Thank you. You've you got that radio voice get down you have. <laughs> it's just trying to, trying to make my voice sound better than it actually is. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, obviously, like a lot of people who will uh, no doubt hear this uh probably know who you are um but for those uh people who don't know who like well well we know who you are now obviously but um if we don't know where to find you on social media and what's and bits and bobs and all that kind of good stuff where do we find you uh yes yeah, so i'm casual mtb on youtube all one word so if you just search that i'm the first one that comes up uh i'm casual mtb uk on instagram because some irritating little swine got that if it got there first with that <laughs> with that uh, username and then on uh twitter and facebook i'm casual mtb as well and my facebook i think is linked to instagram and all that kind of stuff so uh but yeah i post on all of them pretty regularly as well 
Uh, and if you comment, I read every single comment and I will reply to you uh, unless you put something that's completely unre unreplyable to because you, because I've had comments like that in the past where people have said something really inane or really odd about some, a point in my video. So yeah, um, <laughs> if you comment, I will read it at least. And if it's and if it's repliable to, I will definitely reply. If you have any questions as well about things like the the boss nut or YouTubing or anything like that, uh, absolutely, I'm more than happy to help you out and to and to answer any questions like that. Um, it's good to chat. <laughs> awesome, man. Well, it's it's, it's been there. Uh, you know, I should have had you on a lot, a lot sooner. Um, oh, you got bigger things than me to be going on. <laughs> He's so modest. He's so modest. <laughs> um, yeah, so thank you uh, to everyone kind of coming back uh, to the podcast again. It, it's been um, it's been really nice. I mean, obviously, like, the last few weeks has been a little bit hectic. Uh, I've started a new job and uh, been doing a, a bit of everything. So hopefully the schedule is going to be, I mean, just missed the one week, but hopefully the schedule is going to be kind of back to to normal um so you can enjoy your podcasts as regards to um getting it onto a platform um an update rather i i have looked into a few things i have like somebody has been telling me that you can get it up onto spotify uh free of charge i believe uh but i'm not 100 percent sure yet i'm still looking at the thing so that you can listen to it uh without having to have a page open on youtube so uh once again thank you so much for coming back and thank you for justin for being uh, an incredible host and uh, host uh, and guest rather <laughs> um, Don't the wrong way around john <laughs> <laughs> so thanks so much uh for listening in guys i've been the northern rider if you want to check me out on Instagram, you just search for The Northern Rider. Um, obviously, you're on my YouTube page. I am also on Twitter as well, The Northern Rider as well. Uh, thanks again for dropping in, and I'll see you guys in the next one.